say to you a couple of things before we begin. The first one is that we must all suffer from one of two things. The pain of discipline or the pain of regret. Second one is <clears throat> factor Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into the equation because he is in it anyway. By equation I mean every life decisions we take, factor Allah into it because He is in it anyway. When we say factor Allah, we mean, does this please Allah or not? It's as simple as that. If it pleases Allah, we do it. If it doesn't please Allah, we don't do it. If we don't know whether it pleases Allah or not, we find out. The third thing I want to share with you is this very nice quote of Akam Alexander who said, people do not decide their futures. They decide their habits, and their habits decide their futures. And another wonderful quote from somebody else, he said, we don't rise to our expectations, we fall to our systems. And that's why the whole focus on discipline and structure. The last one, selective obedience is disobedience. Because when you are selecting what to obey, then you are automatically selecting what you want to disobey. So selective obedience is disobedience. The question I want to ask myself and you is why are we here? By here I don't mean this room at this point, I mean on the earth for what? Why are you here in this college? Why am I here doing what I do? And that's a very fundamental basic question. It's a very existential kind of question, which I think is very important for us to answer for ourselves. The reason I say that is because the degree of clarity that we have on that question will determine all our speech and actions. And it also makes choices that much easier. If we are clear about why we exist, why we are in a particular place, then choices become easier because obviously you will choose those things which support the reason why you exist. There are three critical things in life which I call my so-called secrets of success. Clarity of goal, a strong routine, and conscious learning and thoughtful practice. <clears throat> Goal clarity is critical because, again the same thing, the degree to which I am clear about my goal, to that degree I will use and leverage my resources. Nobody in the world, without exception, has unlimited resources. Whether it is money, whether it's intelligence, whether it is time, whether it is knowledge or anything, no one has unlimited resources. We all work with limitations. Therefore, the degree to which I am clear about my goal in life, what I want to do, to that degree I will be able to focus my resources in the best place. So clarity of goal. Second one is a strong routine. 
Now, routines might seem restrictive to some people. You might think, oh, I'm losing my freedom. But believe me, this, this, the key to fantastic productivity is a strong schedule, a structure. The third thing is conscious learning and thoughtful practice. I say conscious because learning is like breathing. Everybody, everybody learns. The question is, do we do that consciously? Do we retain that learning? Do we use that learning? Or is it something like breathing which just happens? As I mentioned here, all of this rooted in the bedrock of Ta'aluk Ma'Allah, my connection with Allah. All three of them. So what to do? First and foremost, write down your goal. And my submission to you is that you must write your goal in not more than five words. Ideally four words, but five words. Not more than that. If you find that you have used more than five words, it means your thinking is not clear enough. So go back to the drawing board. Think some more. How will I define my goal in one sentence of five words? Then write it in nice and big block letters and stick it up where you can see it all the time. Right? Second one is create a strong routine and follow it. In my book, the first part of the routine is as soon as you wake up in the morning, make your bed. Make your bed. How many of you make your bed when you wake up in the morning? Two, three, four, five. Fantastic. Those who don't, you're going to do that from today, right? Make your bed. I'll tell you why, because it's a very, very, very good. I mean, I went to boarding school from the time I was six years old. Right through to grade 12. And that's the first thing they taught us. Imagine a six-year-old kid making bed. We made bed. And the best thing about that is that you make your bed and then you have your day and maybe the day doesn't go as well as you want it to go. So when you come back in the, to your room in the night, it wasn't a great day, but believe me, at that time, the last thing you want to see is a messed up bed. So at that time, you go there, you say, fantastic, Alhamdulillah, at least my bed is nice. Whatever day I had, it's a nice, clean, neat bed. So always make your bed. And then the rest of it, your routine, what time do you wake up, what do you do after you wake up and so on and so on, I'll give you that, I'll give you a, a checklist which welcome to use. Conscious learning and thoughtful practice comes with what I call journal writing. Now journal writing is in some ways like a diary but it's not exactly a diary in the journal, the learning journal as I call it, it's not just a diary, it's not saying my dear diary, this is what I did, I went, I met this person, I ate this food, no. Journal writing is focused specifically on learning. What lessons did I learn for that day? So in your journal, you have a page for each day. And on that page, you write the lessons that you learned in that day, never more than three. And the reason you want, you are, you know, you want to restrict those is because you are going to pick the three most important lessons that you learned for that day. Otherwise, it becomes a, like a laundry list. You write like 16 things and you know, you can't, half of them you can't even, so what are you going to do that? So, very important. And finally, <coughs> create metrics for everything. Measurement. Because what we don't measure, we don't know. What we don't know, we cannot control. What we cannot control, we cannot improve. It begins with measurement. So, if I say I had a good day, what is the meaning of that? If I say I, have a, I had a lousy day, what does that mean? Metrics. This is what the learning journal looks like. So take a, take a notebook, draw a line down the center of the page, on the left side, what happened, on the right side, what did I learn? One, two, three. Right? Now, you don't have to write detailed accounts. Because you are the only one who is going to be reading your journal. So write concisely, as long as you understand what you are talking about, that's enough. 
Left side, what happened? Three things. Right side, what did I learn from what happened? And this is based off a, and then of course, the next one is, therefore, what will I do differently tomorrow? Because the purpose of learning is to continuous improvement. Now this comes from this uh, concept we use in our applied behavioral science, which is uh, David Cobb and Harry Ingham's model of adult learning. The model is that we have an experience, like you are having experience now. You invited me here and I am speaking to you about balancing study and religion. So this is a concrete experience. After this is over, you think about this. And I love the term they use, reflective observation, which means in your mind, it's like you are playing a tape of this. And you are saying, all right, so this is what I did. What would I have done differently? This is what I said. What other options did I have? This is how so-and-so spoke to me. This is how I reacted. Was that the best reaction? Should I have responded instead of reacting? And so on and so on and so on. Reflective observation in the mind, right? And then, and this is the key, the core, which is abstract conceptualization. Out of this you form a concept. So what? This happened, my thoughts on this, I could have done this, this way, that way and so on. So what? What did I learn? Now that is what goes into your learning journal, the concept, right? And the last one is, you are doing all this to improve yourself, therefore, active experimentation. What will I do differently going forward? Is it clear? It's a very simple, very neat concept. And you are going to get, get all these slides, you don't worry about that. But idea is to uh, implement that, right? Which brings us to the first part of the topic, what is the meaning of religion? We are saying balancing religion and study, so what is it? In this context we are talking about Islam. So what is Islam? Islam is a way of life. Islam is the method of living our lives in this world. It's a method that is made and designed to make us winners in this world and with Allah when we meet Allah. So my submission to you is, therefore, what does balance mean? Balance usually means some of this, some of that, right? So with Islam, how are you going to do that? It's like this term work-life balance. Have you heard this term work-life balance? Another one is, according to me, an oxymoronic term because what do you mean a work-life? Work is life, isn't it? Work is a part of life, right? So what is that balance? So in terms of religion, this is the platform, it's like in the computer, this is the OS. This is the operating system on which everything else runs. So how are you going to balance it? What's the meaning of balance? Think about that. Now why is that? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Raditu lakum al Islam adina. Allah said, I am pleased to choose for you Islam. What does that tell me? It tells me that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves me. He loves me enough to choose and give me a way of life which makes me a winner in this life and the next. Because Allah doesn't need it, right? The deen is for who? It's for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was someone. He, is, he has no needs. So when I become a winner, who wins? I win. Raditu lakumul Islam adina. Why do I need it? Also because my life, and this includes life in every aspect. My intelligence, my life, my meaning, my, my actual living life, my resources, my wealth, my influence, my education. Everything is a trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave it to me for a reason. We are not just animals, we don't just 
We are mammals, but other than that, we are not animals. Right? We weren't created just to go and eat and drink and do whatever and go home. There's a purpose to our lives. What is that purpose? And on that, we will be held to account before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we meet Him. Which is why we have to ask ourselves this question and say, what do I feel about Allah? What do I feel about Allah? Now, why must you feel anything at all about Allah? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the Quran, in Surah Al-Anfal, in the second ayah, which I recited in, in the Torah of Nisha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُ وَإِذَا سُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَعَلَى رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Verily, the believers, men and women, are those who, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioned before them, their hearts move. Their hearts move with the awe and glory and majesty and love of Allah. And when the ayat of Allah are recited before them, when the ayat of the Quran are recited before them, or when they see the ayat, the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in creation, their iman increases. And the result of these two things, وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ And they have tawakkul, they have complete and total trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Now, question therefore to ask ourselves is, what happens to me when I hear the name of Allah? Does anything happen at all? Does anything happen at all? So let's do a test. Self-test. I'm going to recite some Quran for you. I want you to focus within yourself, on your heart. If it is easier to focus by shutting your eyes, shut your eyes. Whatever you wish. But focus in your heart and see whether anything is happening to your heart or not. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض من ذا الذي يشفع عنده إلا بإذنه يعلم Love you. 
Because whatever is happening is happening with his knowledge. He sees better than you and I can see. He knows better than you and I can know. Ask him. Because he can do what nobody can do. So call him. This is the meaning of Tarnup with Allah. It's all about building connections, the connection with Allah. And all connections take time and they take engagement. You want to be friend with somebody, you have to spend time with them. You have to give time to that relationship, you have to engage. You can't say I'm so and so's friend and I never, I never see them, I see them once in a year. No. So four things. Make this into the routine, into your routine. Pray tahajjud and recite one juz of Quran every day. Wake up one hour before the time of Fajr starts. The time of Fajr now starts at around 4, uh, no, 5.20 or 5.30. So wake up at four, half past 4, which is enough time. Pray tahajjud. Two, two by two, so you can pray two rakat, two by four, six, eight, whatever you want to pray. So pray tahajjud and then read one juz, one sifara of Quran every day. Second one, always, 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 without exception, earn halal, eat halal. As far as meat is concerned, halal means zabiha, which means hand slaughtered by a Muslim. If it is not hand slaughtered, if it is factory machine slaughtered, it is not halal, no matter who puts a halal stamp on it. I wish I didn't have to say this, but this is what happens in the world today. In, in, in the commercial world, people just put a stamp because they want to sell the stuff. They don't care about your, your spiritual welfare. We are what we eat. I'm reading a book now called, called uh, River Kings. It's about the Vikings and it's a book on archaeology. And the latest archaeological technique that they've got is called isotope analysis. With isotope analysis, they can take a skeleton which is 2000 years old and they can do an analysis which will tell them what this person used to eat through their life, which means that they, if they ate certain kinds of food and then they changed their diet, it shows in the bones after 2000 years, I'm talking about physiological changes. What do you think it does to the spirit? Food is not only about food. Food is not only about the body. Food is also about the spirit. Never eat anything which you are not sure about. If you were allergic to something and somebody said, you know what, maybe there is your allergen in this. Some people are allergic to nuts, right? I mean the, the fruit kind of, you are allergic to nuts, but Talking about not the human nuts, the So if somebody says maybe there is, you won't go near it, right? Because if the person is wrong, you die. That's not a good body. So never eat any meat that is not sabiha, hand slaughtered, that you know about. If you don't know about it, don't eat it. You won't die, believe me. Your life and your spiritual welfare is not is worth more than one chicken leg. Yes? Earn halal, eat halal. No interest-based dealings. Don't borrow, don't lend. Number three, fulfill all faraid. Whatever Allah made obligatory is obligatory. Alhamdulillah, we started with praying Salat al Alhamdulillah. And the last one, make dua as if you love Allah and as if you can see Allah. In the famous hadith called Hadith Jibreel, Jibreel is Salaam asked Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is the same Arkan hadith which we mentioned. Umar Ihsan Ya Rasulullah. What is Ihsan Ya Rasulullah? He said, Anta'abud Allah ka'anna ka'tara. فَإِلَّمْ تَكُنْ تَرَافَ إِنَّهُ يَرَى 
Allah. Worship Allah as if you can see him, and if you cannot see him, know that he sees you. Right? So that's the daily schedule. As I mentioned to you, wake up one hour before Fajr and pray the Hajjud and Quran. Number two, exercise. Very, very important. Both aerobic and strength. Which you're not doing bodybuilding, bodybuilding to make big muscles. It's just muscle supple, suppleness and muscle tension and bone, bone strength. Will not come unless you do that. Especially women, don't do this stuff. Very important for you. Right? It's not a question of weight and losing weight and getting This is a question of your health. If something can be put into a bottle and given as health, it is 10,000 steps. That's five miles. I walk six miles a day and I'm 70 years old. So there's no reason why you can't do that. All right? Every day. Yesterday I walked six miles a day in minus six, six degrees below. And I come from a hot, from a hot country. There's no such thing as, as cold. There's only such thing, there's, there's only inappropriate clothing. So bundle up and get out there. Right? Exercise is very, very important. And then of course the rest of the day, I know schedules. I was, the last time I was in college was this summer. In Bennington College in Vermont. I was there for the two month intensive course, immersion course in the Arabic language. I was staying in a dorm and I know all of our college schedules. So, you have to follow that, follow that. All salah on time. When it's time to pray, pray. Alhamdulillah, in this country there's no restriction. You can pray anywhere you like. By all means, pray. Write your journal every night. And then before you go to bed, make sure you have to go. Do the Atkar of the night. And those of you who don't have that, there's a wonderful little small book called History of Muslim, which has all the Atkar, the Atkar of the morning and the night and so on. Just memorize them. Very simple. Right? Do that. You will have a beautiful, peaceful sleep. You will be protected in your sleep. You won't get bad dreams and stuff. And then you wake up for that. As far as eating is concerned, one meal a day. That's more than enough. Right? One meal a day. One meal in 24 hours. Maybe a snack in the middle of the day, maybe an apple or something. A snack is not like a snake. A snack. <laughs> Alright? I want to end with uh, my gift to you and I call this the power of one. And what's that one? One degree more. To excel in life, you don't need to do a lot of hard work. One degree more. At 99 degrees, water is hot. At 100 degrees, water boils. Boiling water produces steam. And steam can power an engine. At 99 degrees, you have hot water. At 100 degrees, the train moves. Matter of one degree more. In 2012, in the men's 100 meter race in the Olympics, Hussein Bolt got the gold medal. The difference between the gold medal and no medal, I'm not talking about gold and silver, gold and bronze, gold medal and no medal, the difference was 0.25 seconds. One quarter of a second. In the Indy 500 car race in 2015, the difference between the first place and the second place was one tenth of a second, 0 0.1 seconds. The difference in prize money was one million six hundred fifty thousand dollars. A matter of one degree or less. So only one degree separates the good from the great. Between growing up and growing old, there is a short window 
during which we have the opportunity to make a difference. Once that window shuts, our life is effectively over even if we remain alive. That window is open for you now. Don't lose it. What differentiates the lion from the antelope? The same thing that differentiates normal light from laser. The same thing that differentiates the leaders from the rest and that is focus. Normal light at best illuminates, laser cuts through steel. Same thing, focus. What's focus? Focus is the art of ignoring fluff. What is another word for fluff? Social media. If you want to get what you never had, you have to do what you never did. If you always do what you always did, you will always get what you always got. Right? Results come from actions and actions define you. It's your life and you are responsible for the results. You are now aware and you have a goal, a target. What's that? One degree more, right? So let me tell you something. On the path to success, there are five realities that we must face. The bedrock of everything is quality. Quality in every aspect of my life. The way I dress, the way I talk, the way I walk, the way I deal with people, the way I study, the way I'm at home, the way I'm outside. Quality in every single thing. This is the meaning of Islam. This is the meaning of Akhlaq. This is the meaning of manners. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about his Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, He said, you are on the best of character. He didn't say you pray the most, you do the most zikr. No. Your character is the best. And I love this Gucci family slogan. This is a quality that remembered long after the price is forgotten. We become what we think. Our mind is like a fertile field. It doesn't care what you plant in it, but it will return to you whatever you plant in it. You plant rice, you get rice. You plant wheat, you get wheat. You plant rice, you want wheat, you don't get it. Right? Number two, attitude. What does that mean? It means that present circumstances do not decide if you will succeed or fail. They only define where you need to start. So it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, which country you come from, and what not, what not. All that it means is you know where you need to start. Third one, faith. I love the definition of Barbara Winters. And she said, when you come to the end of the light of all that you know and are about to step off into the darkness of the unknown, faith is knowing that one of two things will happen. There will be something firm to stand on or you will be taught how to fly. That is faith. Number four, goal. What kind of goal? An extraordinary goal. Because it is in the nature of extraordinary goals to inspire extraordinary effort. Nobody rises to low expectations. People rise to high expectations. Somebody standing at the base camp of Mount Everest does not need a motivational speech. The mountain motivates him. Fifth, perseverance. What perseverance? To rise every time you fall. You fall five times, you rise six times. Success is nothing more than this. To rise every time you fall. And that's why I remind myself to say, we all look for role models. But I remind myself, it's not important who you want to be. What's important is, who wants to be you. And I want to end with this motto of mine, which I invite myself and I give this to you as my gift. I say to myself, I will not allow what is not in my control to prevent me from doing what is in my control. I will not allow 
what is not in my control to prevent me from doing what is in my control. Therefore, forget about balancing Islam. Islam is a tool. Use it. Thank you very much.